find shoes everywhere, and my dog eats the socks. So, uh, so we have one sock of about every kind. So. Uh, I think it'd be a fascinating poll around churches in Utah. And what if we went around and asked people, what's the greatest barrier to continued church growth in the state of Utah? Let me just think about what you think the answers to that question would be. What would, what would your answer to that question be? What's the greatest barrier to continued growth in the church in this state? What's your answer? What, I, 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 I don't think I need you to say it out loud, but I really want you to think about it. What would you, how would you answer that question? Because did you come up with things like hey, political polarization? We're just going crazy, fighting with each other. Maybe the, the presence of a, a dominant religion that isn't Christianity. Maybe growing secularism. That's the biggest problem. Or the biggest barrier to continue to grow. And these things are real. They're real challenges. And I don't think they're incorrect. We have real challenges here. And the work that we're doing here in Utah, planting churches in this valley, brings unique challenges that maybe planting churches in Texas or in Georgia don't bring, right? That being said, none of these challenges are greater than the challenges faced by the 72 that Jesus sent out. <laughs> they, they, they face greater challenges than we do, and yet Jesus sends them out. I, I mean, think about the situation they were in. They were a five, this was a, a fairly tiny group of people following Jesus. Jesus had been telling these people that if they want to follow him, they have to pick up their piece for execution and walk to the death. That's what he's just told him. So he's not exactly giving uh, friendly messages that are gathering more people to want to follow him. He's saying things like, you want to follow me? Walk to the death with me, right? And people are leaving is just as much as they're coming, maybe more. And the Holy Spirit hasn't yet been shed abroad in people's hearts. This is all that's going on right now. And in the face of this, Jesus looks at the 72 before he sends them out, and he says, the harvest is plentiful. <laughs> Today we're going to look at Jesus' plan for engaging what is actually a plentiful harvest. <clears throat> we'll look at what, what it means for us to engage and commit to engaging in this plentiful harvest. Harvest field. So first of all, let's just look at the fact of the abundant harvest. We have to train our eyes to see the abundant harvest field around us and to pray for workers. See, Jesus makes clear that the main thing that pre prevents the church from extending is the lack of people who are ready to proclaim the good news God. Jesus makes it clear that the main barrier keeping the kingdom from extending is a lack of people willing to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. St. Gregory the Great said, said this, For although there are who would hear good things, they are wanting who should spread them. Let me say that again because it's kind of awkwardly worded in English. For although there are who would hear good things, they are wanting who should spread them. Behold, the world is full of priests, but seldom is there found a laborer in God's harvest, because we undertake indeed the priestly office, but we perform not its works. He's really harping on the fact that we're a kingdom of priests, and that all of us have taken on a priestly office, and yet many of us have not done the priestly, the works of the priestly office, which is proclaiming good news to a harvest field that is plentiful and ready to hear good news. So I think there's a question we have to ask ourselves. Do we agree with Jesus that the harvest field is plentiful? That the main issues that keep the kingdom of heaven from extending aren't external to us, but they come from our lack of training, lack of desire, lack of whatever, to proclaim the good news, to just tell people good news. I, I want to just free us from this idea that, like, 
Evangelism is going and proclaiming a message that no one wants to hear around, like going around like a vacuum cleaner salesman and, uh, and just being like, here we go, I'm going to proclaim something that no one wants to hear. And like the goal of evangelism is to try to like convince people to come to the house for dinner and then like shoot So, so like, it's, it, I, 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 
can't say this for sure, but I'd say I'm 98% sure that there's no passage with this many imperatives in the book of Luke. It's just imperative after imperative after imperative. Which is like, which means Jesus is being really directed. A lot of directions here. He's telling us, how do we do this? If you recognize the right harvest field, what do we do? And he's giving step by step instructions to the 72 and then sends to us into like, how do you do this? How do you engage the mission field? And so he tells you, go find people of peace. Go find people of peace. These are people who will receive you. Right? They're people local to you. So I always try to I give a caveat to this in a world where we spend so much time staring at screens. Um, I would say people that you can actually touch in the flesh. <laughs> um, so like they like so not like online relationships that you're having, but, but they might feel really important. They're probably not all that impactful. So like people that you can touch and see in the flesh, people where you live or work or play, who will receive you, who will listen to you, and who will serve you in some way. What? You can serve you, or you make yourself vulnerable to them, and they help you. Um, where we where we proclaim, hey, I'm not the savior of the world. Um, Jesus kind of took that role, so I don't come to be your savior. I come to to find if you're in peace, if you'll receive me, if you'll serve me in some way, or and we can reciprocate service for one another. I'll invite you into my life, and I proclaim and point you toward the savior. So we go and we find these people of peace. And then when we find them, he tells us to remain with them. So he says, remain with them. He says, eat what is set before you. So Jesus actually commands, this is kind of fun. Maybe, I'm a little more extroverted, so maybe it sounds less fun to some of you. But it's like, it's, it's kind of fun to like, eat with people. Yeah. I mean, even introverts, you can say, hey, it's kind of fun to eat. Like, to sit down, have a meal, have a conversation. And what happens when we have a meal, the reason Eucharistic worship is centered on a meal is because we build connections, we, we connect with one another, there's an intimacy that grows as we eat with people, as we, as we find people at peace and we eat with them. We don't have, like, the hospitality culture that Jesus was relying on for these instructions. Uh, but this might be done in our culture by inviting people into our home to eat. Um, by saying, hey, why don't you come in? A, why don't you, would you like to come over for dinner? The point is, eat meals with people. And then he says, do not go from house to house. Do not go from house to house. Which is Joel Green, the New Testament commentator, says this is likely an admonition against moving from house to house in a village for the sake of better accommodations. So he's not saying, like, I can't meet people in one house and meet them in another house or buy them in my house. What, what he's saying is, don't look, when you find a person of peace, stick around with them. Don't go looking for another person. Stick around, build a relationship with them. So when you when you've gone, when you've extended the net, when you've reached out, when you found somebody to reach out, you found like a person of peace, remain with them. Don't look for someone better to hang out with. Um, and, and so some of the language I use, like, um, I've been hanging out with a, uh, a mission president <laughs> in my neighborhood, and uh, he invites me to, like, tabernacle. He, I, I went and visited the tabernacle and talked about temples, and we've had these really cool conversations. But what I'll use language with them, because I'm, I'm very clear about what I believe, is I'll say, hey, I'm not going to break up with you. You'll have to break up with me. So that, that's kind of the language I use. I'm not breaking up with you. But if you if you have to break up with me, I understand. But like I'm gonna like we're gonna be friends and uh, I'm not breaking up, you know. So uh, so uh, and so that, that's some of the language I use, but we find ways to say, hey, I'm committed to you. I'm not quitting on you, and our friendship is a contingent upon you converting to my way of thinking. That I'll continue to remain with you as long as you're open to me. Um, when you have to cut it off, hey, I'm, no, no, it's fine, but I'm not going to be the one cutting that off. I'm remaining with you. I'm sticking with you, right? And so we find these people of peace, we remain with these people of peace, and then we demonstrate and we proclaim the gospel. He says, heal the sick, imperative. You ever prayed for someone's healing yet? He said, 
like this is imperative. Heal the sick. So lay hands on people, pray for their healing, and proclaim the kingdom of heaven is near. That the healings, whether they be physical, emotional, spiritual healings, these are demonstrations of the fact that the kingdom of heaven is here. So he says, heal the sick, proclaim the kingdom of heaven is here. And I just want to share with you, do this quickly. Do this quickly in your relationship. There's nothing holding you back. Friendship evangelism, the way it's often called, is like, hey, I'm going to build a friend with someone in like 15 years from now, when I feel like our relationship has finally reached this level, I'll finally get around to proclaiming like the most important thing in my life. Isn't that weird? <laughs> like, like, you're not building a true friendship with someone if you haven't yet told them the most important thing in your life. You understand that? I can't hang out with someone for a year without talking about the Lakers. Like, like, and how unimportant is that in comparison? And so, like, like you, you are not building a friendship with someone that's true and real if you have not proclaimed the most important thing in your life to them. Your friendship isn't deep. And if you're, and if you're going to tell them, I believe the most important thing for you is that you would be reconciled to God and you've been hanging out with them for five years, what are they going to think? Oh, this must not be that important to you, or else it might have come up sooner, <laughs> right? So I'm telling you, do this soon. Do this soon. Like, when you're building a friendship with someone, tell the good news. Find ways to just explain. There's a good God who, who created all that is, who sent his son Jesus, his son Jesus, Proclaim that heaven and earth are meeting. He healed sick people. He raised some dead people. He, he, he talked about a way that they could be united with the God that created us. And then he died on the cross, the death that we deserved in our place, and rose again three days later. And then he ascended into heaven and he's reigning as king over all the earth and extending his kingdom over all the earth. And he's going to come again one day and all of us are going to stand before him in judgment. And today he's asking you to follow him and be loyal to him and he'll receive you and call you his friend and his son and his God. It's not hard. If we believe it's true, it's really important too. <laughs> if God really has done all this to save the world and, and Jesus, his son Jesus, is the only way to be reconciled to God, not only is it not all that hard to say that, but it's really important to say it. So do it soon. Do it early in the relationship. And then when we do that, we let God deal with the results. We let God deal with the results. So Luke does like a sandwich here. And that's actually more common to Mark than Luke. So it's kind of interesting that he does that here. But we'll see the instructions in the 72. And then you'll see the return of the 72. And right in the middle, you have these woes to the unrepentant cities. Which is kind of weird. Um, because it's more like a dark thing to do. But what we're trying to do is, we're trying we're to interpret the woes in light of what comes around in the sandwich, right? And so what's happening here is we're seeing a fulfillment of what Jesus promises in verse 12. So Jesus promised in verse 12, and I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Then you're seeing Jesus fulfill that. He's saying, listen to what he's doing. He's saying, I deal with the results. Like, it's not, so like, when we proclaim the gospel, just do it. And you'll get better at it as you do it, but I'll tell you this, if someone doesn't receive the gospel, I'll tell you what the reason isn't. It isn't because you, uh, you didn't put your inflection on the right syllable uh, in your gospel presentation, or you, you weren't winsome enough, uh, or you weren't, like, these are not the reasons people don't convert. So we let God deal with the results. So we proclaim the good news, and we let God deal with the results. So listen to me. You are not responsible to people's response to the message of the gospel. May I say that again? You and I, we are not responsible for people's response. 
response to the message of the gospel. However, we are responsible to proclaim the message of the gospel. We proclaim the good news, we're not responsible for how people respond to it. So I want to encourage you to engage the harvest field. Listen, you and I, we have everything we need today to proclaim and demonstrate the good news. We have a God who's favorably disposed to his creation. We have a, a, a world who desires to hear good news like this. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit to demonstrate these good news, this good news. So I just want to encourage you to engage. It's go time. So take, take one step. What's one step that you could walk away, even in your own heart, committing to make, to engage the hardest of this week? Maybe it's making a list of three people at peace. Maybe there's three people at peace in your life you can make a list. Commit to praying for them. And, and, and begin regularly, maybe every day, praying for these people intentionally. Maybe, maybe that one step is inviting someone in the coming two weeks or more. Maybe it's throwing a barbecue and inviting your neighbors over your house. See, because despite pictures of evangelism, that have this picture is running into some room where no one wants to hear us and yelling about Jesus, uh, despite these pictures of evangelism, it's really a gift. You and I have an opportunity to tell people something they already want to hear. The mission field is 